the first question we need to answer is what is a mechanism? What is a mechanism? In terms of mathematical primitives. And as we usually do, let us proceed by analogy with game theory. So how many of you remember what is a game? So what constitutes a game in terms of mathematical primitives? Players. Good. So you define a set of players, basically who plays the game. And it's just the labels for the agents of the set of agents. Okay. Another thing, strategies, very good. I'm always indecisive whether I should write strategies or actions because these are very different things. Um, let's say actions. I wrote actions in my notes and I, I will assume that this is for a reason. And finally, fail. Perfect. You know what the game is. I'm very happy to hear that. So, fails. These are three things that constitute a game. So we have players that constitute some actions. And in the end, every player gets some payoffs depending on actions that everybody chose. Now the question is, what of these which of these should we retain in our mechanism? And which ones are we designing? So, what's a mechanism? Let's just start from the top. Players. Is it something fixed? Is it something that we design? Okay, yes. The, the design of the game affects the number of players who are participating. This is a, a relevant concern, but I would rephrase it. In particular, let's say we have a set of players that we want to attract to our mechanism. Sometimes we can just force them to participate, but sometimes we need to ensure that they actually want to participate in the mechanism. So, I will say that we still fix the set of players, but sometimes we need to satisfy their what is called individual rationality constraints. We need to ensure that they will be willing to participate in the mechanism. So, okay. We still have players. Then, what do players do after they decide to participate in our enterprise? Well, that's exactly for us to decide, right? This is where the mechanism kicks in. We decide what the players will have to do. So this is our black box, which is, of course, actually orange, but I don't have orange, so I'll have red. So this is the mechanism. What happens after the players have played the mechanism? What is the result of that? We design the mechanism in order to achieve some outcome. So we have a fixed set of outcomes. And we just choose among these outcomes based on how players play the mechanism and what they chose in the mechanism. And then we have, as usual, the payoffs for all players. I was, you know, here it's a little ambiguous. So part of it is given. Players' preferences for outcomes are typically fixed as part of the environment. But you know, often we'll be using, we'll be having some freedom in designing the pairs. In particular, we'll have the opportunity to pay the players or take their money. So it will obviously affect their pairs as well. So okay. This is pretty much it. Now let's do the same thing in math. Addressing Zoom people. I would prefer if you unmuted yourself and spoke. 
because this way you can speak directly to me and I don't have to kneel in and read the chat. Uh, but one question in there is uh, what's the difference between outcomes and payoffs? Will the payoff take into the consideration the payoff to the designer? Okay, so the first part of it, uh, outcomes is what we decide to do. So it's the decision we take. Do we build a bridge or not? Whom do we give the item that we are auctioning? Uh, how do we allocate the chores among people in our social group? And so on. So this is what we do. Payoffs then determine how happy people are with different outcomes. So if I receive the item, I am very happy. But you know, if I do not get the item, I'm not so happy. This is captured by my payoffs. So yeah, payoffs map outcomes into utilities. The second question was, uh, will the payoff take into the consideration the payoff of the designer? And this will vary. In part, in some settings, we will explicitly maximize the designer's payoff, such as, you know, we want to design a revenue maximizing mechanism to sell the item. In other cases, instead of caring for the, instead of maximizing designer's payoff, we will instead have some fixed outcome in mind, or fixed choice function in mind. Again, as we will see very soon. And we will want to implement that at any cost. So then we will not, in a sense, care about the designer's preferences, but uh, designer's preferences will be there implicitly in the sense that the designer will, wants to implement some given choice function and not the other. Is the designer considered a player in our environment here. This will vary as well. So whenever it, whenever we do that, the designer will be player zero. But otherwise, we will have a fixed set of players. So let us now finally just define all these things more formally. Uh, our set of players will be from one to n. Or sometimes from zero to n. And in this case, zero will be the designer. It will often be inferred from the context whether we include the designer in the mechanism or not. And with a piece of notation, I will sometimes denote the whole set of players as n as well. But again, in perfect the context. Okay, so we have the players. We have then a set of outcomes. We will denote the representative outcome as little x and the set of outcomes as big X. If players have fixed preferences regarding outcomes, uh, and they are all known to the designer, then the game is pretty boring, right? We will just, we know exactly what outcome players want most, and we will say that, you know, we will pass a law that says this is the outcome that we should do. So as I said last time, the interesting part of the problem is that we do not really know which outcome all the players prefer together with the designer. So we want to choose the outcomes contingent on players' information. And how do we model information in games? Private information in particular. We model it as players' types. Players' types. Every player i will have some type state i, except for the designer. The designer never has any private information. And we'll denote the set of all such types as big theta i. Now these types, they have a dual role in our setting and in games in general. On the one hand, they denote, uh, they represent players' information. So what the player knows about the game, what player knows about other player's types, for example, if 
these types are correlated across players somehow. And on the other hand, these types represent um, preferences. Preferences. So this is their primary role. And once again, information is meant if I know something about the distribution of other players' types, then I know something about their preferences in particular. Okay. So, players' outcomes types. What is missing compared to this? Uh, types, type profiles. Let's impose some distribution. So, we'll say that types are distributed according to some fixed distribution. So, types. I'll even go so far as to say type profiles. So it's a vector of all players' types. Theta 1, dot, 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 theta n is distributed according to some distribution with CDF capital F. And this distribution is commonly known by all players, including the designer, and it is agreed upon by all players. Finally, we have the payoffs, payoff functions. We will represent those as utility functions. So these will be UI that map uh, outcomes and types. So large X product big theta into well, the real numbers. So there is a you get some utility value from every outcome, but the utility you get does depend on your type. And in general, it might depend on other steps. But this, this will not be the case for most of what we talk about. So these are the primitives. What is left now? We still do not know what a mechanism is, and we do not have the terminology to talk about what is the outcome that we want to get. OK, and uh, another question is, why can't the designer also have hidden information or type? That's a good question and a tricky question. Thing is, because that setting is hard. So when the designer himself has some private information, the designer can signal this information to the players through the choice of the mechanism. Right? If I am the designer, I, I know that and you know I'm selling some item of privately known valuation. So only I, only I know how good this thing actually is. And I will say, if the item is good, I will set high reservation value in an auction. If the item is bad, I will set a low reservation value, something like that. So this problem of choosing the mechanism that is itself contingent on the designer's information is really hard. It's not been solved in general, I believe. So there are some steps. There is the inscrutability principle that says, well, you know, the designer will still, um, the designer will still offer one unified mechanism. But then the designer himself will act as one of the players and will report to the mechanism as well. Right? But not that much beyond that. So yeah, the answer is we do not do this because it's hard. Bless you. But we will never assume that the designer has any private information, and that's important to remember. Moving on. Another definition that we need is a social choice function. And a social choice function is exactly something that you guessed. It is a function f that maps type profiles into outcomes. 
So it is something that tells us if all players have this type profile, what is the outcome that we should implement? So this is something that we want to do. This is something that we want to reach. So, a few more definitions to go. Not too many, I promise. A mechanism. Finally, a big reveal of what is a mechanism. I'm underlining all these in different colors, but this does not mean anything. So, what is a mechanism? As we said, a mechanism fits in here in our scheme of things. And overall, so these four elements of a mechanism should kind of reduce to these three elements of a game. So a mechanism is kind of the frame of the game, right? It tells us what the agents can do. It tells us what the agents should be able to do. So the first important part of the mechanism is an action set. So we'll denote a mechanism as a big gamma. And a mechanism should specify action set, big A, for every player. So A1, I forgot that, sorry, thank you. A mechanism specifies an action set for every player, so A1 to AN. But there is one more thing we need. In particular, we need a way to map these actions, so outcome of this artificial game, into the actual outcomes of the of the mechanism, into the, the actual outcomes we want to implement. So we will also have this function g, which is which maps action profiles, so outcomes of that artificial game, a1 times a n into the outcomes x. Okay, so these a's are action sets, and this g is an outcome function. The question was uh, is this a static environment or a dynamic environment? In principle, so if we go back here. You can use this, this general generic abstract framework to describe any game. Static, dynamic, with perfect information, with imperfect information. So, so far we do not really care about that. In particular, these action sets can uh, represent a dynamic game, an extensive form game. Or they must represent a normal form game, so a static one, but Every dynamic extensive form game can be represented as a normal form game. So we can write any dynamic game as a static game. So this does not matter for the time being. Okay. And the, the final definition for the for this part is implementation. In particular, we will say that I'll mark this is a separate definition. So we will say that a mechanism gamma implements and the definition here is of the word to implement and the concept of implementation implements a social choice function f if again you can pretty much already guess but we need to write this down formally if there exists um, yeah, an equilibrium An equilibrium strategy profile A 
A1 star, and so on. We'll call the equilibrium stars sometimes. Uh, so there is an equilibrium strategy profile of what? So an equilibrium of what? Of the game induced by gamma. I'm still running out of space. And this equilibrium must be such that the outcome prescribed by the mechanism at that equilibrium. So a one of theta, a m star of theta is exactly coinciding with whatever we wanted to get according to the social choice function f equals f given this type profile. This should this type should also depend on players. Okay, so this coincides with f of theta one, etc. theta m done. A mechanism implements a given social choice function which prescribes different outcomes to different type profiles. If it implements that exact outcome G given an equilibrium of the underlying game. I would like to emphasize that this definition is not actually completely formal. In for or mal. And I want to ask you, why is it informal? It seems like so many words and even a few mathematical symbols. So what's the problem with it? What are we missing here? Exactly. Thank you. We, are, we do not know what an equilibrium means. We do not know what the equilibrium concept we are using is. And in general, there are many different equilibrium concepts. But I will ask you to come up with a few of those after the break. So, during the break, I drew this diagram to summarize all the concepts that we've seen so far. With the game, it's pretty simple. The game itself is defined by players' actions and payoffs. And within the framework of a game, there arises an equilibrium. So it's the equilibrium is endogenous to the game, if you want. But to realize what exactly equilibrium is, we need an equilibrium concept. With mechanism, we have the environment, the broad environment that's fixed in the mechanism design problem. It's given by players, outcomes, and payoffs. And it's important to remember to specify types of players, because we are typically dealing with games of incomplete information, to make the problem non-trivial. Now, within this environment, we define a mechanism which is given by action sets and the outcome functions. Finally, within the mechanism specified within that environment, a game arises like this. So within this game, we have an equilibrium, again, defined by equilibrium concept. And uh, beyond all that, we have a goal, something that we want to achieve, given by the social choice function f. This goal, I guess, is within the environment for the designer, but it's beyond the environment for the players. So our players, they do not care about this goal at all. They may not know what it is. They may know what it is, but it does not really matter. Because this goal does not manifest itself in any way except for the mechanism choice by the designer. And finally, to really to understand whether the equilibrium of this game induced by the mechanism achieves our goals. Um, I guess not to check, but whether they coincide is given to us by the concept of implementation. So does this mechanism implement this social chase function or not? Now, let us use this helpful diagram to talk about some of your mechanism proposals. In particular, uh, Let's take a couple of proposals and decompose them into all of these elements. 
Now, there were a few proposals which spoke about, well, basically allocating an item, like uh, either a scarce item, like um, uh, seats on an overbooked flight, or um, bottles of beer among students with different valuations for alcohol intoxication. I love that phrasing. Or heterogeneous items, like spots in a bar queue, closer to the bar or further away from the bar. So let's take one of these problems and split it into this. I will take yet another problem just to spice things up. Let's not allocate items, let's allocate responsibilities. There was one submission uh, about finding a dedicated driver. So you are driving, you and friends are driving to a wedding in the Champagne region. Obviously, no one wants to be sober, so how do we decide who has to be sober to drive you all back? The players in the setting are the group of friends, and the designer is, I guess, one of these friends. We rarely specify the designer explicitly, but it's usually useful to understand uh, who the designer is. Now, what are the outcomes? What, what is the space of possible outcomes in this problem? It is the allocation of the chore, right? It is the allocation, the decision of who ends up being the sober driver, the dedicated driver. Pay of stall players, I guess here you can model them differently. Well, you can model them any way you want, but in general, everyone has some preference over outcomes. And we will solve this problem with money, so everyone has some preferences over outcomes and money. And these preferences depend on players' types. So players' type in this problem is something that characterizes their preferences, firstly. So their love for champagne, their love for driving, and their distaste for partying sober, I guess. But also, since we have money, their type can include their love for money. Right. And in principle, again, if we are speaking about correlated types, if I know something about preferences of the others, this will also be included in the types. A mechanism, in this case, will be an action set in a choice function. So in this proposal, it was suggested to use our favorite second price auction to see, you know, but in reverse. So it will be a procurement auction, right? We are not auctioning a positive item, we are auctioning a, um, an obligation, basically. So the way we do it is everyone submits bids on how much money they would accept in order to be the designated driver. And the person who places the lowest bid wins and receives the second lowest amount of money. So in this case, the action sets for each player are bids. So AI will just be the real um, line, space of real numbers. And G will say that well, whoever named the lowest number gets to be the gets to be the driver. Okay, equilibrium concept, let's skip that. Implementation is just here for the for the sake of it. The social choice function is an open question, right? What do we want here? In the ideal world, we do want efficiency. So we want uh, to choose the person with the lowest distaste of staying the sober, the, the dedicated driver. So this will be our social choice function here. But in principle, depending on who the designer is, you can think that there might be some you know, second thoughts. Like, I'm the designer, I do not like that person, I would really want to tilt the mechanism to make them suffer more. Something like that. This will obviously be inefficient. So, this is one example. There were quite a few other submissions uh, about second price auctions for things. But there was one other submission about allocating chores again, but with no money this time around. So this was a problem of deciding who brings what to a potluck dinner or a Dutch treat, the expression was used. I do not know what is 
the more popular name here but it's basically an event in which everyone brings something to a dinner and then you eat it together and the question is who brings the food and who brings the drinks because you know some people are good cooks some people are bad cooks and when you choose wine you also you can also slack off and bring cheap wine so pretty much all of the items are similar here the difference is uh, this group decided to avoid using money. You know, we're all friends. We do not want to settle with each other to bicker over money. So the outcomes here were just the allocation of chores, plus some other way of punishment. And I'm I'm covering this proposal to show that you do not necessarily need money if you have other channels through which you can reward or punish players. In particular, in that suggestion, it was uh, suggested to punish players who bring bad food or bad wine by mocking them, by laughing at them. Uh, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but I think that was the idea. And the thing is, that would work, right? Because people would want... Being mocked and shunned is, in principle, the same as losing money. It's, it's also painful, it's also kind of a punishment. So we can provide incentives using this mechanism. All right, so there are all these allocation problems. And if, if I'm not covering your proposal, it does not mean it was bad. In fact, I like pretty much all of them. It's just I'm trying to select those that will serve the most pedagogical value. And so my favorite proposal, probably, and also the one that will serve some pedagogical purpose here, was uh, the one about a desert island. In particular, there are two people stranded on a desert island with no food, no water, no nothing. But they have a boat. The boat can fit one, and uh, they can get on this boat and go somewhere with the hopes of being rescued or with the hopes of finding another island with food and water. So let's start with what we know here. I'm not telling the whole story yet. Players are our two players. Their types would be their physical strength, which will determine what is the probability of them staying alive eventually, you know, if they embark on this boat. The outcome is who gets to go in the boat. And the social choice function here is once again efficient. So we're trying to maximize their joint chances of survival. So we want to put whoever is more fit on the boat for them to have a higher chance of uh, rowing to to land to to rescue ships and not dying in the process and then maybe they can send help to the other person as well so social choice function makes sense in this respect uh, there are payoffs once again you have a lot of flexibility in modeling payoffs so presumably here people prefer to stay alive rather than dead Although there is a question of how they ended up on a desert island. Um, but let's say they prefer to stay alive and they're just regular human beings, right? They, they like what humans like. The mechanism that was proposed is we want to find the most physically fit person. So the best way to do that, according to the authors, is a good old fight to the death. Because whoever is more fit will presumably survive and uh, will get on the boat. So in this, actions are, I guess, punches, kicks, throwing coconuts, and so on. And G will be the last man standing gets, gets on the boat. Now, why is this uh, an interesting example, apart from the story itself? This is actually an example in which I thought maybe I want to write something, but I don't know what to write. This is an example in which the mechanism itself changes the set of feasible outcomes. And basically, the mechanism in itself, yes, let's say it changes the set of feasible outcomes. Because in principle, we can say that outcomes are whoever stays alive at the very end. And rather not uh, who gets on the boat. If in this interpretation, whoever gets on the boat will um, 
probably survive and will probably save the other person. So it will affect the probabilities with which different outcomes are implemented. But if we have a fight to the death, then we are ruling out the case in which both of them survive. So we are restricting the set of possible outcomes here in this respect. And probably already directly affecting pairs. So probably people do not like fighting that much. Maybe they do not, maybe they do not even like killing other people. So our mechanism, in addition to choosing one of the outcomes or choosing a stage before the possible outcomes, uh, our mechanism will also have direct effect on pairs. This is not usually the way we do things in mechanism design, because if you can avoid all that, if you can avoid any interference on this, it's good for you, because it gives you more flexibility. Then you can have an effect on payoffs. Of course, you can design payoffs, you can design monetary payments or anything. You, of course, have the effect on outcome which is chosen in the end. But the way we see mechanism design usually is there is one adult, the designer, and he assembles all the little kids, the players, brings them to the sandbox and tells them, you know, you play around here, and then I will come back and see what, what you did, and I will decide what to actually do here. But none of the things that those kids do in the sandbox actually affects any of these choices, except through what mechanism, what the designer said the designer would do at the very end. OK, so the bottom line here is try to keep track of uh, all these elements when you're designing the mechanism. And if I did not cover your proposal, feel free to revisit it and try to identify again all of these parts. And uh, that was one takeaway. And the second takeaway is we ideally want the mechanism to not have any real effect except for what we, except for what we intend to do. Would yeah, that mechanism be efficient? Yeah. Exactly. So this, is, this depends on how you frame the problem. So if you frame the problem the way I initially did, our outcomes is whoever gets on the boat, and our social choice function is we want the strongest person to get on the boat. In that formulation, our mechanism is efficient indeed. And sorry I did not repeat uh, the question for Zoom people, but the question was, is it indeed the efficient mechanism? So in that initial formulation, it is. But you see then, as we went on to think more about the problem, we said that maybe the outcome is not whoever gets on the boat, but the outcome is actually whoever gets to stay alive. And then, you know, there are some restrictions on possible outcomes, so we cannot directly choose the outcome, but we can choose the action that affects the outcome. And in that formulation, that more complicated formulation, this mechanism will not be efficient. But this, yeah, okay, this is another lesson on the dangers of rigorous thinking. So you can do everything correctly formal, from the formal point of view. I would say, you know, these are the outcomes, this is the efficient choice function. But you also have to always keep track of the intuition behind all of it. You have to understand what all of your math means and is this really, are you really doing the thing that you want to do? How is it guaranteed in that example that the second lowest value is a value that player, players can actually pay? Okay, yeah. So this is a question that goes back to our uh, first proposal about uh, designated driver. And the question is, you know, we are saying that there will be some amount that we have to pay to our driver. But where does this money get from? Where does this money come from? And this is a good question. And this mechanism just leaves it out. Or actually, I think maybe that group uh, actually included that in their proposal, saying that you know we take that bid and we uh, we split that amount we have to pay among all the other friends, so they all have to chip in and pay. But in that case, it is worth realizing that the mechanism is no longer a second price function. Because you have this extra amount you have to pay, you have this extra monetary effect of everything. So it will no longer necessarily be an equilibrium and dominant strategies there to bid truthfully. 
okay but budget balance is the property that we're looking for that we're talking about and this is sometimes yet another property that we might want in our mechanism along with individual rationality that we talked about before so we will talk more about these properties as we go on 